Have you ever wondered what a scientist really does? I mean, in the news you mostly hear scientists discovered this or a study showed that, but what was their actual work behind? For example, in 2001, when the first full sequence of the human genome was published, you could hear about scientists who read the human genome. But how can you basically read something that is so small that you cannot even see it under a microscope? Or in 2015, when the existence of the Higgs boson was confirmed, a particle that is so, so small that our DNA looks like a gigantic mountainside compared to it. Mostly, you hear about excited scientists and how hard their work was. The work itself stays there as a miracle. One possibility to shed light into this miracle would be to read the according scientific article. Because scientists are used to publish their results together with the methods they've used and a discussion of potential problems within a scientific journal. Unfortunately, these articles are mostly written for other scientists and therefore they use a pretty alien language and are extremely hard to understand for non-scientists. Another option to find out what a scientist does could be that you just ask the scientist yourself. And maybe you are lucky and really get a good answer, but in many cases he will use the same alien language as the one he used for his article and again, you don't understand what he tries to explain you. A third option would be that you become a scientist yourself. And this is the way I've chosen. But to be serious, it's quite a long way and it's definitely not suitable to everybody. So you only move the problem to the next. On my way, I followed my curiosity for humans in general and our evolution and genetics in particular and studied biological anthropology. While doing so, I climbed up the stairs of this proverbial ivory tower. I learned the particular language of my field and became a part of the community. After finishing with my master's, I got a PhD position in a plant research institute. And even if my own topic was still closely related to what I did during my studies, I've never worked on plants before and therefore I had to learn many new things. Especially, I had to learn a new language and it took me a while to become a part of my new community. This is because not all scientists sit together on one tower speaking one language, but every field and every discipline has its own tower speaks its own language and forms its own community. So when we think again about our initial problem to understand what a scientist really does, you see that it's worse because already within science you can have such a hard communication problem, not to mention everybody else. At the same time, it's not uncommon that we have different communities speaking different languages. And by these different languages, I do not only mean the different languages we have between different countries. But take, for example, a group of teenagers and a group of managers. They barely speak the same language. And the same holds true for all scientists. But sometimes it's useful to be able to talk to a broader audience. And the good news is there is kind of a universal language. And by this language, I mean the arts. As Marcel Proust said in his search for a lost time, the arts enable us to see the universe through the eyes of somebody else. I would like to focus now on visual arts, because right in the beginning of my PhD, I made an interesting experience. I had to give a talk at a conference, and I was looking for pictures for my presentation in the internet, but I could not really find what I had in mind, and so finally, I just drew it myself. And the feedback I received after my talk was incredible. All the people were so enthusiastic about my little drawing. And I, at the same time, was extremely surprised. Because I thought that science and arts are mutually exclusive. You know, science is very objective and about the hard facts. And on the other side, arts are highly influenced by a personal perspective. On a second glance, 
it became less surprising to me. When you think about this gigantic world of design that is everywhere present in our everyday life, on all sorts of products, their packagings and advertisements, or even the use of symbols just to avoid misunderstandings and to keep the message as clear as possible. And by this I focus on graphical design and this power of visual communication and this form of visual communication already in, uh, get into science. And we have many people more or less, less closely related to science who use illustrations, comics or forms of animation to illustrate scientific outcomes. For me, after my first drawing, I just kept on drawing all my signs and um, then one day Thomas came to me. Thomas is a former colleague of mine. He is a bioinformatician working on highly complex genomes and he spent a lot of time in thinking about how to visualize such a complexity. And while thinking about visualizing complexity, he had the idea how about accompanying a scientific article with some form of illustrations so that the content get open to a broader audience? Of course, as you might guess, I was very pleased to become a part of this idea and together we started to give our project a more concrete shape. This project is called The Art of Science, or short, Taos. We want to make science more beautiful and our major goal is to build a bridge between the sciences and the arts so that we can make scientific contents open to everybody who's interested. Of course, this is not a simple task. And one of the biggest issues is that many scientists fear to lose the scientific accuracy through simplification. And this is why we want to connect the scientist and the artist directly, so that the scientist can have a look that the content is still okay and scientifically accurate, and at the same time, the artist looks that it is understandable to a broad audience. Now I would like to give you an example how this interaction could look like. And for this, I would like to talk to you about the new Bali reference genome that was published last year by Martin Mascher and his colleagues. I guess when you see the title, it sounds complicated, but let me show you it's not as bad as you might think. So what they did is they used a barley variety called Morex that is mainly grown in the US as a malting barley, so to produce beer. And when your goal is to sequence a genome, the first thing you have to do is to get the DNA out of the cell. Within a cell, the DNA is densely packed inside the nucleus, and it's not packed as a big ball, but in form of these X-shaped chromosomes. So first, they unfolded these chromosomes, separate the two strands of DNA we have, and then they cut the DNA into many, many, many little pieces. And we still need to cut it into many little pieces we because we can sequence a short piece of DNA with a higher accuracy than a very long fragment where we introduce many mistakes. So in the next step, they inserted the little fragments into little circles of DNA, so-called bacterial artificial chromosomes. And they are used kind of as a vector to make many copies of um, our tiny little fragments that are then sequenced, really read base by base inside a sequencing machine. And what you get out are these little code snippets where you see the four different bases we have in our genome decoded as the four letters. And you will get millions of these code snippets. And they are like a gigantic puzzle. So in the next step, they had to solve this puzzle. And for this, you, need, uh, you take overlaps into account between the little fragments, and you compare it to already known information about the order of a genome, in this case, um, of the Bali genome. 
they are kind of maps. And with help of these maps, you can put the tiny little fragments into longer fragments, so-called super scaffolds. And in the next step, they compared information they had from the super scaffolds about to which chromosome they belong. And like this, they were able to order the longer fragments to their chromosomes. And finally, they produced the new chromosome ordered Bali reference genome. That was a very brief overview and many details are still missing. But I hope that these pictures could show you how we can use illustrations to tell a scientific story. But as you might have realized, I, I haven't used pictures alone. But as I've said, I told you a story, so I used words. And a picture has the power to give us this immediate access to the content. And the story at the same time, a good story at least, has the power to touch us within, to reach our emotions. And together, they can make this little plant of knowledge grow in everybody's mind. And we say that knowledge is power. And indeed, knowledge is power, especially today in times of fake news and alternative facts. It is essential that we are able to come to our own conclusions, to form our own opinion, and to decide between right and wrong ourselves. And for this, we as Taos want to create a network. We want to combine the power of knowledge by the scientist with the power of visual communication by the artist and the power of storytelling by a journalist. We are right in the beginning. So to make this network possible, we need you. So if you are a scientist and you would love to share your research with a broader audience, or if you are an artist and you want to make illustrations for scientific outcomes, or if you are a journalist and you would love to write about the stories behind scientific research, then please join our network. Together, we can make science more beautiful. And it might happen that together we actually change a running system. Thank you.